Board game breakfast time. It's board game breakfast time. My name is Tom Vassell, and you're glad that you're here. This is another week of gaming. Well, yeah, I'm trying to think now. We're hitting October, so it's the Halloween season. In fact, this end of this week, we'll be going to the Halloween Horror Nights at Universal. Um, and some good news. First of all, I apologize for the delays, but finally, Kickstarter stuff is getting shipped out. It's all coming together, shipping out, so that will make a lot of people happy. Uh, and I'm doing a live Q&A later today, so come back and talk to me then. Um, there's lots of cool reviews and things coming out this week. And you know what? I should mention here, Dicetower.com. So we have a website, in case you haven't noticed, Dicetower.com. And on this website, we keep track of, we try to put up news items each day. So if you're like, well, I wonder what's going on with the Dice Tower. It's a good way to see what's going on. You can go in there and check out and find something cool. We're trying to put different news items up each day so you can keep track. And also, you can search through and find reviews on everything there. Uh, and if you like a review, maybe from a certain designer, you can click on that designer and see other games of theirs that we've reviewed also. All right, well, with that being said, let's start with the news. All right, not a ton of news this week. Uh, Z-Man has a new game coming out, Party Bugs. This is a little card game based on a cockroach disco party. Not in my house. Not in my house. Uh, let's see. Horrible Games. Dragon Castle will be coming out as an app next year. So that'd be cool. A lot of people like that. Although, I'll miss the tactile feel of those tiles. And they've just recently released the expansion for Potion Explosion. The fifth ingredient. Speaking of apps, Simon has a few new games. One is Sugar Blast. This game is not an app, but it sure looks like one, right? If you're going to be you know, moving things around, trying to get a certain number of things in a row. Candy Crush, all that style. And wow, the graphics of this game certainly bring that to life. There's also going to be four more army boxes for the Lannister army. Boo! And for the Stark army. Yay! But they're all dead. Um, and then Simon is reprinting Blue Moon City. This is a fantastic game. I really enjoy it. Uh, I was never a big fan of Blue Moon, but Blue Moon City, where you're using different cards to move things around. And the production for this one is stellar. Very excited to see this one when it comes out. Capstone has a new game, Ragusa, which looks really cool. Well, okay, let me rephrase that. It doesn't look cool at all. It looks, I mean, it's a it's a worker placement game, and you're kind of building walls in a city, and I'm like, ah, okay, I've seen this before. Yeah, but it says there's like 50 different actions that you can do at any given point. You can do multiple actions. When you take a closer look, a, a close look at the board and stuff, it looks a lot ne neater than it did, you know, kind of from the overview. I'm actually interested in this one. It says it only takes an hour, so that sounds fun. Portal is releasing. You can buy an Imperial Settlers player mat. So if you just want the big player mat to play Imperial Settlers on, game's very popular, so why not? And that is all the regular news. Let's keep moving. Hello, fellow gamers. I'm Glory Hound, and I hope you guys enjoy hanging out with me and talking about Kickstarters because I love talking about crowdfunding games. I devote an entire live show to Kickstarters every week, weighing the pros and cons because I cannot stop buying them. So I know I should probably seek some sort of help for that, but I'm in far too deep at this point. So let's get started taking a look at the uh, crowdfunded items I've got for this week. First up... We have Highway to Hell by Red Joker. This is for two road warriors looking to do more than just blast 80s metal songs out their car window like we all do. This post-apocalyptic push-your-luck card game is for those who are 14 plus and looking to spend about 30 minutes customizing your sweet ride, patrolling sectors, and testing your grit as you get to pursue vehicles, dispatch enemies in shootouts, and try to enforce what little law is left in the land rules for this bad boy are available on their Kickstarter site and you can pick up a copy of your own for about $39. Uh, if that's not enough death and despair for you though, perhaps Kill Merlin 
by Schumann Family Games can poison your goblet. Um, this set collection game is for two to four awful wizards of the respectful yet murderous age of 13 plus, okay? These people are looking to collect mystical ingredients and mana to learn spells in the right combination to murder an unsuspecting Merlin. Now, keep in mind, you only have about 30 to 90 minutes to insert or aka murder Merlin while making sure your opponents don't summon the correct magical spells to do the job first. But as a first-time backer or a first-time creator, expect delays if you end up backing this project, okay? Next up is Hero Master. Hero Master by Noble Artists is a game for two to four bumbling villagers of 14 plus looking to become the least disappointing hero in about 45 to 60 minutes in this very adorable dungeon crawl. This will lead you into comedic absurdities that happen as you roll critical failures, you squabble amongst your friends on who's going to become the party leader, and you use card management to vanquish your foes. In this take that card game that requires you to begrudgingly work with your opponents at times in order to take home the most money and get out of the dungeon. So this adventure will cost you about $38 unless you're in it for the metal coins and theme dice, which who isn't when you're into Kickstarter? I mean, you're going to be spending the extra money, let's be honest, okay? But if being the best worst party leader isn't your jam, then maybe becoming king of the jungle would suit you better. So Welcome to the Jungle is by Coffee Cake Gaming. This game is for two to four anthropomorphs that are 14 plus seeking to become kingpin of the jungle. You do this by um, doing tasks to gain street cred, starting turf wars amongst your friends in the jungle, and buying weapons and goodies, and the most gangsterly and important of all tasks... <laughs> which is gambling and bidding on outcomes, okay? So this is about 60 to 120 minutes. You can take home this terrifyingly adorable gangster starter kit for $60. But keep in mind, this is also a first-time creator, so expect delays on this project, okay? So if you want to hear more about the Kickstarters that I mentioned today, go ahead and join me live on Fridays as I go through the pros and cons of the Kickstarters we just mentioned. I hope to see you guys all next week. Have a good one. You know, sometimes war games get really detailed. And as a matter of fact, today's game is incredibly detailed. It's actually the second day of a three-day battle in the American Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg. Longstreet Attacks is actually the third game in a series of American Civil War games designed by Herman Lutton, the first one being Stonewall Sword, the Battle of Cedar Mountain, the second one being Thunder in the Ozarks, Battle of Pea Ridge, third game, the game that we'll be talking about today is Longstreet Attacks, the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. What's cool about this game is there's a blind sword chip pull system that means you just pull a situation out of a cup and you gotta deal with Basically, it. the situations you're gonna deal with is fog of war frictions of war and fortunes of war fog of war you don't know what's going on frictions of war the battle ain't going as good as you planned it and fortunes of war the battle's going better than you planned it what you get with this game is 352 playing pieces confederate side and Union side. You get two play raid cards, one Union and one Confederate, two combat results, table cards, game track cards, and two six-sided dice. And one of the most beautiful hand-drawn maps by Rick Barber, nonetheless, that create such a personal touch. When you play a war game, it creates a story. This one is absolutely no exception. It's really, really fun. Long Street Attacks, the second day at Gettysburg, a game designed by Herman Lutman, developed by Fred Manzo and Roger Miller, and the art is by Rick Barber, Charles Keebler, and Mark Mahaffey. You know that old pair of slippers that you always, always look for? This is that game. Thank you for watching, and if you want to know more about war games, please check out my channel, No Enemies Here. Hi! 
Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Based on a hugely popular series of novels, the Dresden Files cooperative card game has entered the board gaming app world. How does this game, based on the fate system, fare in the digital world? Well, let's take a look. Published by Evil Hat Productions and developed by Hidden Achievement, the Dresden Files app is available on iOS, Android, and Steam. In this card game, players work as a team to solve otherworldly cases without being overrun by foes. You'll play clue cards to cases and attack cards on foes, whittling away at their challenge level to knock them out. Your efforts will be hampered by obstacles that you'll want to clear, and thankfully there are advantage cards to help you, but those are rare. In some ways, the Dresden Files card game is a lane battler because you work two rows of cards from left to right. Each of your cards has a range which determines which cards you can potentially even work on, and on top of that, you have to manage your limited fate points to play any of the cards, adding a tense hand management element as you decide which cards you can do without in order to gain back those precious points. And this all matters because it's important to try and clear those rows before you go into the showdown with some fate points to spend for a final push to win, which is easier said than done. I haven't played the physical copy of the game, but the app, especially on a tablet, plays really smoothly. Each game you select a story deck that includes a variety of thematic cases, foes, obstacles, and advantages, and there are difficulty levels to adjust your challenge on top of that. The app has an unusual amount of multiplayer options, including just playing with somebody in the room on separate devices over Wi-Fi, and that's a pretty rare feature. And there's a solid selection of other app settings to adjust that really allows you to cater your gameplay experience to your preferences. The Dresden Files app has a fully interactive tutorial that does a great job of teaching you the game and the interface. A card index and a rule set are also fully built into the app. And if the base game isn't enough, the app includes at least seven expansions that you can buy as IAP, each of which includes two new characters and two new book decks. As someone who doesn't know much about the books or TV series, I can't really say how authentically the setting and stories are implemented, but every card looks highly thematic. And as someone who is kind of neutral on the IP, I can tell you that I love this app. The story elements are interesting enough to pull me in, but it's really that puzzly gameplay that hooks me. In solo mode, you can see all the cards available in each hand, and managing those carefully to deal with the board, your del it, it feels very strategic. Picking just the right time and the right cards to sacrifice for fate, when to use your character's one-time use ability, and other choices, all in that intuitive digital experience, means I find the Dresden Files cooperative card game app challenging to win, but fun and easy to play. Give it a try. <laughs> So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, we'll be taking a look at the Brady Bunch game. It's kind of a social deduction game. Age of Towers, not Age of Dice Towers. Uh, uh, um, this one's a Portuguese game, but it's like Tetris Planet. This is a new game from Blue Orange that you'll have to, super unique game. Dice Club, uh, you might not want to miss that review. Oregon Trail game, is it better or worse than the first one? Uh, Rock the Bach, what does that even mean? Photo Finish, a racing game, sort of. Embark, this one's set in the Harvest Universe. Uh, Patchwork Express. And Monster Crunch, Frankenberry or Count Chocula. And then finally, I'll be taking a look at City of Gears. We'll also be taking a look at a few other games, so keep an eye out for that. And we'll be continuing our top 100 games of all time. Uh, we're going to be putting out one of those a week for the next nine weeks. If you missed the intro, we did it last week, so just keep an eye out for that. Also, Dice Tower tonight, this Wednesday, that will be live uh, every Wednesday night. Me, Eric, and Chris will do a live show, and I really think you should come, and those are fun for us to do a lot of cool things. Um, and a podcast goes out every week. This Tuesday's podcast will be Mandy and Suzanne, so stay tuned for that. And, of course, check out the rest of our podcast on DiceTowerNetwork.com. Hello guys, I'm Cardboard Rhino and welcome to One More Rhino Says Yes. Today I brought you, I guess, a blast from the past. It came out like 11 years ago and it's still robust in its design and fun to play. It's Notre Dame. 
In Notre Dame, the players take on the roles of the heads of influential families in Paris at the end of the 14th century, and they compete for reputation and prosperity. The board pieces are arranged slightly differently depending on the player count. Each family controls one of, in this case, three districts that surround the site of Notre Dame. In each round of the game, you start by laying out three special person cards who you can hire to help you at the end of the round. Each player drafts three cards and can play two. These action cards can be used in nine different ways. You can place influence markers in the various sectors of the districts in order to gain money, prestige, influence markers, avoid the plague, and the more you invest in them, the more you can get back. Before you move on to the next round, we have penalties for those who did not take care of the health of the people who live in their district, letting the plague spread, which is symbolized by rats displayed at the bottom of these cards. After three periods of three rounds each, the player with the most prestige points is the winner. Notre Dame is a light to medium Euro game, which is a very good intro to Euros for newbies. The game gives you a lot of different actions to choose from, but it manages to cleverly avoid the brain drain situation. I love the fact that because of the drafting in parts and the short rounds, it's pretty quick and you get to enjoy the pacing of it. There isn't much sitting around and waiting, you're engaged most of the time and you have to deal with the heavy attrition and you have to predict the right time for you to do the right move. There are also some interesting expansions to it, so Rhino says yes to Notre Dame, I think it still got it. Howdy folks, welcome to By The Numbers, my name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. This week's topic, are heavy games actually heavy? So I went out to Board Game Geek and got the top 25 games of all time according to their database and I looked up the actual physical weights of those games and compared them to their complexity weight. Hold on to your hats, it's about to get mathy. I used a coefficient of correlation which compares two sets of numbers and tells you how related those numbers are to each other. The calculation, which I won't go over, gives a result from negative 1 to positive 1. If the end result is a positive number, it means the sets of numbers are positively correlated, which means as one set of numbers goes up, the other set of numbers goes up. If you end with a negative number, just the opposite happens. As one set of numbers goes up, the other set of numbers goes down. If your result is close to 0, it means the numbers are completely unrelated and have nothing to do with each other, statistically. So, I took those numbers for the top 25 of BGG, churned out the calculation, used an Excel formula, and came up with a result of 0 0.30, which means they're positively correlated, which means as the weight of games, the complexity of the games, goes up, the weight of games also goes up. Kind of. So if you look at this handy dandy chart, it shows you that 0.3 means they're moderately correlated, which means they're moderately related, which means they kind of have to do with each other. So the next time someone asks you what the heaviest game you've played is, you can give them the physical weight or the complexity weight, either or, and be moderately right. See you next time. Greetings and welcome to the Mega Meeple. I am Thomas Grogan, and I, yes, Autumn, the temperatures are starting its descent, the tree leaves are starting to change color, and my favorite time of year is here, Halloween. <laughs> so, for the entire month of October, I'm going to be going over my favorite horror-themed board games that I like to play on Halloween, starting with... Tiny Epic Zombies. Uh, it has a variety of modes to it. You could do uh, cooperative or competitive. Four players and a fifth player playing the zombie. Or you could have four players against a zombie AI. And you, as a survivors, uh, trying to uh, finish three out of the nine possible uh, objectives that you could choose. And you are basically in a shopping mall uh, trying to uh, achieve these objectives to win the game before the zombie player or the zombie AI kills you. <laughs> now this, this game is very enjoyable, at least to me, and 
evidently to a lot of other people. But to me, the, the, the play is like, uh, like I'm in that movie, uh, Dawn of the Dead, uh, 1978 movie by George A. Romero, where the, the, these uh, survivors are camped out at this shopping mall. And this game has a lot of that atmosphere to it. So what about you? What uh, board games do you like to play to get you in that scary mood on Halloween? Sound off in the comments down below and let me know what you think. And as always, if you want to find out more about the Mega Meeple or follow me on any of the social media stuff or listen to my weekly podcast, just go to the, uh, the website. All the informational links are there. And until next week, Stay scary. <laughs>
is it allows you to practice the mechanics of the non-cat fa uh, factions. And I think that is valuable in its own way. It helps you learn how to play the other factions and learn the mechanics and maybe try out different strategies that you might want to try with other players. On its own though, it really just does that. It, it doesn't give you that full rich experience that you're going to get from Root. So, while I'm very glad it's there, I appreciate that I have been able to play it and I will continue to play it, it's not something that I would recommend as a purely solo game. So, there you have it. I appreciate your time as always, and have a great day. If I look slightly frazzled here, it's because I'm recording this in the morning after having walked to work. Work, uh, the stu Dice Tower Studio is about 15 minute drive from my house, and as I've learned today, it is a two hour walk. I guess it could be faster if I ran, but in the heat, walking is what it is. Now, the thing about this walking is I've been walking regularly. I'm trying to lose some weight, and besides cutting back on what I eat, I figured walking 10,000 steps a day would be handy. And today, since one of our cars is in the shop, I thought, hey, I'll just walk to work and see what that's like. Well, when you decide to start walking to work, I'd say maybe halfway through, if you decide that you don't want to do it anymore, you don't have a lot of options. Sure, I could call an Uber or call my wife and say, please pick me up and drop me off at work or what have you. But at the end of the day, you got to finish what you start. Uh, but I like that. It's a goal that I set each day to walk 10,000 steps. I use a program on my phone called Pacer, which keeps track of that. It shows me that other people walk and that, that constant, that goal of getting to 10,000 keeps me motivated and I, I just want to keep going. But uh, I was thinking about goals in general. Uh, so every year I see people, they have a goal to, there's different goals people do. Some people do a 10 by 10 where they pick 10 games and they say they want to play them 10 times over the course of the year. There's a hundred times one where people try to pick a hundred different games and play them over the course of the year. I've done that at least. Um, and, and these are not bad goals, right? It's, it's not a bad goal. Maybe your goal is to spend more time gaming with family. Maybe your goal is to spend less time gaming. Maybe your goal is to watch less YouTube videos and actually game more. Maybe your goal is to, you know, not buy any new games until you play the games that you have now, right? We all set these goals. And I'd rather talk about goals now than like January 1st, which is when most people set their goals. And in fact, I think that goals set throughout the rest of the year have a much higher probability because you don't have that pressure. Everyone has, I gotta think of a goal on January 1st. And because of that, that January 1st thing, sometimes we wait till January 1st to set a goal. I rather just set the goal now. With the Dice Tower, very clear goals. This is what I need to do. This is what I want to do. This is things I'd like to do. These are things I need to do. And I think the Aptitude towards finishing a goal will often depend on how important a goal is. See, for me, the importance of losing weight is a big goal, right? There's health reasons. There's a lot of different things involved in that. Being a good example to my kids, things like that. For me, a goal of, let's say, playing a game 30 times is not as important of a goal. It's a goal that's maybe fine and everything, but if I don't do it, I think I'll be able to sleep at night. There are some goals, spend more time with your family, which I would say are much more important than... Uh, I need to be going to game three nights a week. But goals can be hard to accomplish. They're easy to set. Sometimes they are difficult to get to. And, you know, I read about this. There's all sorts of self-help books and things about goals. But I think gamification helps me with goals. Gamification is taking something and turning it into a game to some degree. There's all sorts of things. There's I have a, an app on my phone, which I haven't really got into, called Habitica, where it takes, like, everyday things and turns them into an RPG. Uh, like I said, with Pacer, I've taken my steps each day and turned that into a game, uh, trying to accomplish a goal. Even like standing on a scale every day is kind of a bit of a game as you watch it. Your points go down and your points go up, you know, instead of weight. You're, you're, it's kind of like points in a game. And I found that when I look at life like that, I got to get these things done. And there's a couple things that I think are really cool. One, I really think games are important for this reason. You know, people ask me about gaming, and sure, gaming is fun, and gaming is a hobby, and gaming is definitely a privilege. We don't need to game to go through life. But gaming really does help you prepare, especially if you do a lot of strategic gaming. In a strategic game, you are planning your strategies and then following through on them. And then in life, we need to do the same thing. We need to plan for our goals and follow through on them. And I think gaming is so critical for kids and for adults in that regard because it helps you hone your planning skills. 
And when you do that in a game and when you turn life and when you do gamification in life to get to your goals, they become more fun and they're ultimately more satisfying, I think, when you reach them. It's really easy to give up on your goals. It's really easy to say, I need to do this. Like today, I would say halfway here, uh, the sun came up. <laughs> so in Florida, I started walking at uh, 6.30, got to work at 8.30. And so around 7.15 or so, the sun was about fully come up. And I thought, now might be a good time to call Laura and say, can you come grab me and take me the rest of the way to work? Because she offered to do it anyway. But you know what? I said, no, I said I was going to finish this. And then I started counting off each hundred steps, counting off, you know, the, the little percentages to get to my goal. And then I got here. Yay. Now that's not a tremendous goal, right? It's not like running a marathon. It's not like, you know, running all across America from one coast to the other. But it's a goal that I made, a goal I knew I could reach, and a goal that I did accomplish. When it comes to gaming, I can make these same goals, try to accomplish them, and I found that gaming and life start bleeding together in that way, and I think it's a good thing. It's your turn. Ooh. Hi, I'm Randy. I'm Ellen. Tonight we are cozy in our house. I'm in my PJs because it's late. It's late. And we didn't need to be doing it this late. But um, we are. We are. The kids are in bed. It's quiet. Do you guys hear anything? I don't because it's, it's quiet. The kids are in bed. Okay. Um, we're talking about Azul tonight. And there, I literally have nothing bad to say about this game. It is just straight up relaxation at its finest. Yeah, it's it's really, really good. It's a it's, really good game. It works with so many different people. We've introduced it to a lot of non-gamers, non -gamers, a lot of new people. Uh, we've recommended it to friends who haven't bought it, but they should have. Um, <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great. It scales really well. Two, three, four mm -hmm. players. Um, at two, I, I really, really like it at yep. two. Because we can kind of mess each other over yeah. when I know that she has something coming up. So I don't have to rely on the other players to try to mess her up. I can do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> so we get we get a little feisty when we play together. We do. We get feisty. <laughs> um, need I mention the beautifulness of this box? I don't think I do. I think you all can see how beautiful Yeah, it's it is. been said many times, but yeah. it's, it's true. It's, Say it again. It really looks great. It's beautiful. Um, it sounds fun. It's like clicky. And uh, it's beautiful. They look like little Star Wars, people say, right? I think they look sorry, like Star Wars. I thought maybe like little chocolates or something. But um, it's just a fun game. I feel like it's a classic. belongs in everybody's game closet. Um, one of my brothers said, hey, you want to play Uno with me? And I'm like, nah. And he's like, please. And I said, fine, I'll play Uno with you if you play Azul with me. And he did. And he loved it. He was like, wait, what is this? And I could see that, like, what is what are board games? Oh, yeah. Opening up in his eyes. And yep. it was amazing. So... It's a great night. It just, it really does work with so many, so many different people. Yes, it does. So. Anyway, uh, our picture of the day. <laughs> I took this one and I'm proud of it. Enjoy it, guys. <laughs> it's a picture of some cows in Door County and it actually looks pretty cool. They all it's, lined up to us. Yeah. We like walked up to it and they all just came to the fence and yeah. were staring at us for some Probably reason. Probably looking for food or something, but yeah. yeah. Enjoy it, cows, guys. Let's see ya. Hey, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. I've been doing board game makeovers for many years now. And in this episode, I would like to take you down memory lane and show you some of my favorite board game makeovers and the board game makeover award that I won for that makeover. Now these board game makeover awards are from the Board Game Makeover Academy, which I am the sole president. And now I present to you my top 10 board game makeover awards. Nominated and won by me. Number 10, most time consuming. This was Simpsons Carcassonne, base game of 72 tiles plus a couple expansions totaled over 100 tiles of individual artwork where no two tiles were the same. And then I created both a four inch laser cut balsamic birch wood version along with a two inch true tile version of tiles where I got them from Home Depot. This makeover alone took me more than 80 hours to complete. Number nine, most expensive. Definitely giant size ticket to ride because the expensive part was the Thomas the Tank Engine minis of which I needed five sets of 44 in the various player colors for a total of almost 250 Thomas minis. Add in the wood, the bolts, the nuts to hold the minis and other materials. This makeover cost me well over $500, but it was darn worth it.
Number eight, most funniest, my game room episode. In this episode, I shared my game room under my stairs that I made up as a mockery of all the people who have beautiful game rooms. Actually, I was really jealous, so I just did this one as a fun thing. Number seven, most controversial. Definitely Fallout Santorini, where I took those beautiful white buildings and painted them colors from the Fallout series, and many people did not like this. Number six, most smashing. This was Blood Rage Simpsons edition during the live episode at Dice Tower Con this past 2018 season, where Tom took that giant hammer and decided that this makeover was not good. Doing a board game makeover is not like an easy bake oven making a cake or anything like that. It takes time, commitment, money, and a whole lot of imagination. One of my most favorite quotes is by Albert Einstein. And it says, the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. I just found it on the web a few minutes ago, but now it is the whole foundation of why I do this. Thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. I will see you next time. Hi everyone, I'm Jen, the Board Game Librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with this week's segment, From the Page to the Table. This week I'm going to start a uh, special spooky Halloween themed s series for October with some of my favorite picks for books and board games to get you in the mood for Halloween. This week's pick is Dracula by Bram Stoker. This is a book I read 10 years ago and I must admit, and you will never hear me say this, especially as a librarian, I like the board game better than I like the book. So here's why. Um, it, it's fine. It's fine. It's it's good. It's really good. Um, but the thing to me is, you know, you spend this whole book, you know, really ramping up and you're traveling and really trying to get Dracula, right? And then there's one paragraph where you actually catch him and then you get him. And you're like, what? That's terrible. So that's why to me... Fury of Dracula captures that whole essence of what Bram Stoker was really trying to do. We got a best-selling novel. It was a sensation in 1890s when it was published. This, however, to me, captures all of that. We have that cat and mouse chase. We have the tension. We have the battles that go on, too. My husband and I have had some really epic battles, um, both as Dracula and the investigators. This is my favorite deduction game of all time. And really, it's just really sizing up your opponent and trying to, where are they? Are they one step ahead of me? Am I one step ahead of them? Um, just an awesome game, so thematic. Um, the cover here really doesn't do it justice to how fabulous this game is. An excellent pick to start off our spooky month of October. That's all for this week. Happy breakfast! Bye! On this episode of Gaming with the Tired and Completely Unshowered People, we bring to you... This week, Hanuma Koji. Two-player game, once again, quick! Hanuma Koji went over really well with us. So this is a card game. You have four actions you can take, and you can only take each action once. The interesting thing about these actions is most of them you have to allow cards to be available for your opponent. So you don't want to give them anything that can help them too much. So you try to figure out what helps me, what doesn't help them too much. So there's this interesting mental gymnastics you're trying to pull up. You have to give up some control, which I'm not super comfortable with. It's pretty. They're geishas. It has my favorite thing a game can possibly have. The rule book explicitly states that the youngest player goes first. First of all, I'm a month older and I'm always forced to go last. I heard you say older. So that's what, the, I can show you the rule book if you. Look, Hamana McKinney, I don't know. Hana McCut, what is that? Hana Koji. Go get yourself four geishas and win at life. Hana Makoji. Is that correct? I don't have my glasses on. Yeah, that's great. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Natter's Plays, and today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over Catch the Moon. 
So this is a dexterity game where you're stacking all these different ladders onto a cloud and you're trying to catch the moon. So let me show you a little bit about this game and why I really like it. You'll start the game by laying out these ladders in any random form. You'll grab these straight ladders and you can place them in any two spots on the cloud. A player will roll this die and whatever the outcome is, you'll grab a random ladder and place it onto the structure. If a player rolls a single ladder, then the ladder that you're placing into the structure has to only touch one ladder. If a player rolls a two ladder result, then they'll have to place a ladder touching only two ladders on the structure. If a player rolls the moon, then the ladder that they place has to be the tallest ladder in the structure, and it can touch no more than two other ladders. If you're placing a ladder and if any of the structure falls down, that piece is removed from the game and the player will also gain a tier. The game will end in one of two ways. Either all the ladders have been placed or someone has received the last tier. Whoever has the least tiers in the end wins. So as you can see, there are very few rules in this game and they're simple to teach. The great thing about this is that you can pretty much show anyone how to play this game. So the more ladders that you're stacking onto the structure, well, you're going to shift the center of gravity. And because of that, it's going to become less stable. You're placing a ladder and you're kind of unsure how things are going to move around. You're trying to avoid things from falling onto the ground because you don't want those tears. And that's what makes this game so much fun because of that stress element and you're unsure of where to place things. And that's why I really enjoy Catch the Moon. Well, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Dave. Welcome to the pitch. Hi, what you doing? Ooh, your Essen wish list. I taught you well, my son. Ha <laughs> ha. What is it? Meeple Circus. Ah. Uh, Expansion for Meeple Circus with a bear and a lion. Sure, sure. Well, we'll get that. Eldorado! The quest for Eldorado. Heroes and hexes. More Eldorado. That's a fun game. I, I can see that. I can see that make it in our collection. Sure. Forbidden Sky! <sighs> Why? Why would you like Forbidden Sky? I mean, we love Forbidden Desert, Forbidden Island. Rockets! Yeah, it's a cool rocket. Okay, okay, Forbidden Sky. Gizmos! Gizmos! Because of the marbles, of course. Yeah, I can see that. Gizmos is a very cool game. And Pitch it's car! Pitch car! They have a looping now! Yeah, sure. I mean... Marble bobsleigh! Marble bobsleigh. It's a, it's a really cool bobsleigh track. We are sure going to have a look at that. Yeah. And that's it? No. No. Please, no. please! <laughs> no, Cool Running. Cool Running is every player's got their own ice cube, and your goal in the game is to be the last one alive. So you're you're putting salt on the ice cubes of your opponents. Uh, even put a, a, a blowtorch on it. I think I don't I don't think the game comes with a blow. What you doing? No! Bring back my computer. Uh, Okay, we'll see. We'll, we'll have a look at Cool Runnings. Yes! Hey there, everyone. I'm Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with this week's segment, Turn the Page to the Table. This week, I'm going to start a uh, special spooky Halloween-themed series for October with some of my favorite picks for books and board games to get you in the mood for Halloween. This week's pick is Dracula by Bram Stoker. This is a book I read 10 years ago, and I must admit, and you will never hear me say this, especially as a librarian, I like the board game better than I like the book. So here's why. Um, it, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's good. It's really good. Um, but the thing to me is, you know, you spend this whole book you know, really ramping up and you're traveling and really trying to get Dracula, right? And then there's one paragraph where you actually catch him and then you get him. And you're like, what? 
what? That's terrible. So that's why to me, Fury of Dracula captures that whole essence of what Bram Stoker was really trying to do. We got a best-selling novel. It was a sensation in 1890s when it was published. This, however, to me, captures all of that. We have that cat and mouse chase. We have the tension. We have the battles that go on, too. My husband and I have had some really epic battles, um, both as Dracula and the investigators. This is my favorite deduction game of all time. And really, it's just really sizing up your opponent and trying to, where are they? Are they one step ahead of me? Am I one step ahead of them? Um, just an awesome game, so thematic. Um, the cover here really doesn't do it justice to how fabulous this game is. An excellent pick to start off our spooky month of October. That's all for this week. Happy breakfast. Bye. Like most millennials, I'm not really one to complain, but when I do, I like to make it awkwardly public. I bought a new game this week, and that's because it had Stefan Feld's name on the box. It's called Carpe Diem. Doesn't it look lovely? I don't really care that much about artwork on board game boxes. And this game had Stefan Feld's name on the box, as I said, so I bought it, obviously, because I love Stefan Feld. It's grey. Now you'd think Ravensburger would be able to use all their jigsaw money to maybe, I don't know, hire an artist? I mean, there is an artist, obviously, for this game, because it has art on the front of the box, but there's no artist credited, which makes me think they honestly just could not care. I mean, the box is grey, the name is Latin, and the picture is real ugly. And again, I don't care, but I want to play this game with other people who do care. And they care. They... They put Stefan Feld's name on the box and thought that'll sell it. That'll that'll sell the that'll sell the game. Everyone will everyone will flock to the local board game market, and they'll they'll whip it off the shelves knowing Stefan Feld's name, and they'll go, "Oh, that's for me." They could have sold if 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 the game looked nice, just nice. It doesn't need to look brilliant. This game could be a massive hit. It won't be because it's so so ugly. And I just feel like Ravensburger just do not care about selling games because, I mean, so although I kind of resent them for this production, I would honestly suggest you go and play Carpe Diem because it's a phenomenally great game. I absolutely love it. It's just baffling. Anyway, that's all from me this week because I'm just so angry I could scream. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much, guys, for joining us again. Um, always keep on track. Uh, keep watching all the different segments. Thanks to all my contributors. They did a fantastic job, as always. Okay, so the future uh, is coming. Uh, like I said, the Kickstarter stuff is going to be delivered soon. We hope you guys continue to enjoy the Top 100 list. The thing that I was looking at this week, the futuristic idea has very, very good potential, so very pleased about that. Can't tell you guys more just yet, but we'll be getting there as time goes by. Lots of exciting things coming. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much for watching. Until the next video, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.